Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, forging a wakizashi. So today I'm showing the forging of a wakizashi. That's the medium length Japanese sword. Now, warning up front, I'm using you guys kind of as guinea pigs today. Uh, and I can tell you ahead of time, the experiment failed. Um, so look, you know, I take a lot of pride in the production values of my videos, but yeah, that's not happening here. Today, this is basically going to be just what it would be like watching me give a presentation at a hammer in or a convention or something like that, or even a class in my shop. So first warning, this video, unlike my normal videos, is going to be close to an hour long. I'm not showing every single hammer blow, but you know, pretty close. There's a lot of stuff here and a lot of it is just hands on watching me work. More importantly, I'm telling you now, you know, I've recently moved to a new shop. It just echoes like crazy in there. Uh, I haven't entirely figured out the audio situation, and so the audio just completely blows. If that's going to bother you, please pull the rip cord before your delicate constitution is uh, harmed by the psychological brutalization of all that echo and background noise. All right, preliminaries over. Let's forge a wakizashi. So... What I'm going to be doing today is forging this piece of steel into a Japanese style blade. I always, you know, I never say that I'm making Japanese swords, I have to say Japanese style blades. Uh, so this is a piece of not mono steel, modern high carbon steel. I will be first doing a kind of preliminary forging stage, and then the second stage will be forging it down to uh, the actual bevel final shape. But the first stage is going to be a preform. So the idea of the preform is that you want to build all your basic um, geometry into it, but not the bevels. If you try making bevels at the same time that you're doing all the tapers, and there's a distal taper, which means the width of the blade as it narrows down towards the tip, and then the uh, regular taper, which is the overall the, the widest uh, part of the blade from top to bottom, uh, that also tapers. So if you, if you forge those tapers in first, then it makes forging the bevels and all the final little nuances of the shape, whatever it might be, makes it way, way easier. So that's what we're going to be doing first.
flows over into that uh, sort of fish mouse type type of shape, you want to do something to fix it. Worst case scenario, if you have to go back to the grinder and grind it off, do it. Uh, but once you figure out, you know, the ways to uh, to work around it, uh, you're fine. Digital, uh, you know, a digital cal 
helper. Uh, but they're all, you know, these things are super cheap Chinese things. They die after a while. And you can still use them next to the fire. I'm not actually trying to measure real precisely. I just want to see what the widest part is. And then I can eyeball it and figure out roughly how much taper I want to put into it. So this is just an extremely rough measure. Hey, let me jump in here and mention that if you're into Japanese swords, I have a full set of videos available on my website that focuses on making Japanese swords. Today's video is really a very rough and ready thing that just covers forging. The videos on my website are a whole different ballgame. They're really carefully produced, lots of close-ups, nice audio, voiceovers, whatever, and so they're designed to lead you through every step of all the various processes that are involved in making Japanese style blades. That's going to include forging, clay hardening, making hamones, polishing, mounting, handle wrapping, fittings, uh, you know, all the woodwork that's involved, you name it. So link in the cards in descriptions. Let's get back to it. Unfortunately, it's starting to 
scene with a lot of background noise. Uh, like I said, the, uh, the audio is going to be terrible in this video. Uh, I do it on front, but uh, this one makes it worse. So uh, thanks for hanging in here. So that is my blade. Like I said, I'm now going to taper this uh, this end five inches. We'll ultimately work it to about six inches, maybe four and a half into six inches, and that'll give me about the uh, the distance that I want for my tank to, to taper. My engineer's hammer, this is a three pound hammer. Um, in this case, I'm really trying to taper it fast. Uh, it, it's a less of a precision thing because um, you know, when you're tapering along a really long uh, section of the blade, even the tiniest little mistake will, uh, will show up as a, I mean, could even ruin your, your sword. On the tag, on the other hand, you're doing something really short and uh, you can get a little more brutal on it. Like the bevel ought to go on this side, 
But actually what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on the opposite side. And what happens is that as I forge in that bevel, as I remove or displace material here so that it's smashing inward, it starts flat like this and smashes inward. As you smash that in, it starts to lengthen the cutting edge. So what's going to happen is that this is going to start to turn down towards the other side. And so the side that looks like it ought to be the cutting edge will actually become the spine of the knife. Uh, and otherwise, there's really nothing too remarkable about the next phase. I'm just going to go through section by section, about five inches at a time. And uh, the way that I typically do it, it's four heats per, um, per section of four to five inches, depending on how thick it is and some of the geometrical uh, considerations. This is going to be a simple, single beveled blade, what's known in Japanese as a Hirazukuri. Uh, uh, geometry, it's not going to have that secondary bevel that's characteristic of most katanas, for instance. Uh, and so that's going to bend this down, and we'll just go section by section. So it'll be about four or five sections to get through here. Each one, I'll heat one side or one section of four or five uh, inches. I'll bang away on one side. When it starts to cool down, back into the fire, then I'll flip it over and I'll forge the other side. By forging from side to side, uh, it keeps it straight. If you forge all on one side, it will cause the whole thing to just twist. So by, uh, by doing side to side to side to side the entire way up the blade, um, you maintain reasonable straightness. All right, so uh, I'm gonna knock off for today and then I'll come back tomorrow and uh, show the uh, completion of the forging of this blade. All right, so we're back for day two of the uh, wakasashi here. Today we're gonna be uh, putting the bevels on here. Got a nice dry shirt, so uh, we're pretty much ready to go. I'll just stick it in the forge and uh, we'll start forging. Normally, I go four heats. This time, I'm probably going to do five. Uh, 
This is a little bit wider than I would normally uh, forge at the tip. This is probably going to end up being close to an inch and a quarter wide, which is a good deal wider than I would normally have that tip. So it's going to take one more heat.
you can do. Going fast, hitting it really hard, sometimes it makes sense to do that, but when you're, when you're forging the shape, any inconsistencies in the power of your stroke or the placement of your strokes, your hammer strokes, are going to cause dings, divots, twists, um, all kinds of inconsistencies. And those are just things you're going to end up either chasing while you uh, continue to forge or even having to remove through a whole lot of grinding later on. So the more that the, your hammer blows are consistent, the more that they're consistently placed, uh, the better it's going to be. All right, next section. This will be the final section of the blade, really, and then we'll turn to the uh, tang. So something you'll notice is that when I first started hammering, my uh, sword was running just parallel to the edge of the anvil. I kept it right next to the edge. The idea here is you don't want your hammer digging up the face of your anvil. Um, you're always hammering at an angle like this when you're beveling. And it's easy when you haven't done this for a while to let that bottom, that trailing edge, uh, hit the anvil, ding up the face of it, which you don't want. So you have to do a certain amount of anvil management as you're working, uh, in part just to avoid smashing up your anvil, but also um, just to keep from twisting and torquing the uh, blade into shapes you don't want. If your tongs are sitting up here on top of the anvil and you hit here, you can see that's going to force the uh, a curve into the blade, and you don't want that. So you never want your tongs resting on the anvil. So whatever you have to do, when I start out here, I can have the tongs at the end, and it's real easy to access this along this, uh, this side. As we get up here, that no longer becomes possible, and so I switch to a position where I'm working more like, like this. There are some guys who make knives, and they always work this way. Uh, nothing wrong with that, that's just not the way I do it, uh, but I'm always being cognizant of where that hammer is in relationship to the uh, anvil. Once you have a certain amount of skill, you're not going to miss all that often, but still, nobody's perfect, and so the more that I can minimize smashing up the anvil, uh, the better. Alright, so next, we have uh, gotten to the end of this the blade section. So now we're down to the tang. So what I'm going to do is flip it around and uh, work from the tang out. Now, when I do that, I'm going to start. I've been going one, two, three, four. This time I'm going to go one, then flip it over to two, three, four. The reason for that is because I've flipped the blade around, uh, I'm also going to work, uh, in order to work the same side of the blade that I've been working all this time as my first um, set of uh, strikes, it's got to be on the opposite side of the end, and I've got to change the angle of my hammer. The reason that I care about that is because if you don't do that, you're more likely to impart twists into the blade. The longer a blade is, it gets geometrically harder to keep it even. Um, you know, you can forge a three or four inch blade all day long and you never have to worry about it twisting. You don't have to be all that careful about how you forge it. But the longer it gets, the more that the consistency that I was talking about earlier uh, becomes important in keeping that blade as straight as possible.
notice that I hit it a good deal harder uh, when I'm working the tang. The tang is fairly thick um, and it's less crucial. If you have one little bad hammer ding there, uh, it's not going to cause you the same problems as it would on the uh, bevel of the actual cutting edge, the blade part. Um, you don't want to get too crazy, but uh, you know, I, I do swing a little harder than uh, once, I'm, once I'm on the tang. Uh, 45 minutes ago, I was dry as a bone, uh, so welcome to Georgia in the summer. Dripping sweat now. Basically, to the shape that uh, 
you know, that we're looking for here. So the next step will be grinding. By the way, uh, I just did a video last week where I showed the grinding of, um, man, I am pouring sweat. Uh, I showed the grinding of a Tonto. The principles are all the same. Uh, this was basically sort of recapitulating a uh, talk that I gave at Blade Show two, three weeks ago. See what the next step of this would be. Basically, uh, that's covered in the video that, uh, that I did um, with this talk that I gave uh, with the Ameribrade guys at Blade Show two, three weeks ago. So, uh, hope you enjoy this and uh, you know, I may show some other things further on down the line of, you know, where this where this comes out, but this is basically where it is right now. Okay, so that about wraps it up. I wanted to show you the final product, but at the time of production, I still haven't finished this blade. So just to give you a flavor of what the next phase of this process looks like, um, I'll show a picture of it right here uh, after grinding. You know, it still has this weird kind of awkward shape that won't be fixed until the heat treat imparts that characteristic uh, curvature that you see on most Japanese blades, certainly on wakazashis and uh, katanas. All right, thanks for suffering through the terrible audio in this video. Uh, we're going to have that sorted out in future videos, but... Uh, didn't have it here. Hope you managed to pick up a few tidbits along the way. All right, we'll see you soon and keep making those knives. Thanks for watching, guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. Digging the channel? You can support our video making efforts on Patreon. You know, I've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years. So I hope you'll show some love for all that hard work. Link in the cards and descriptions. Finally, if you're interested in making Japanese swords, check out my full line of Japanese sword videos where I show how to forge Japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings, handles, and scabbards. Walter Sorrel's Blades dot com.